Well, welcome, and thank you very much for coming. And I hope you enjoy it, and hope we'll, we'll see you at future events. Um, just before I turn the podium over to my colleague, I did want to mention, uh, well, first of all, so for, for you newcomers, um, not familiar with the SETI Institute. The SETI Institute is a nonprofit research organization with research, education, and outreach programs in the space sciences. Specifically, our mission is to explore and understand and explain the nature and origins of life in the universe and the evolution of intelligence. You can learn all about the Institute at our website, which is SETI.org. Easy to remember. We hope you'll visit there and visit there often. Lots of cool content. Uh, and we hope you'll come to these uh, programs. Another big part of our outreach activities is our own radio program called Big Picture Science, the host of which, Seth Shostak, our own senior astronomer and fellow of the Institute, is actually going to preside over tonight's uh, speakers. So we look forward to meeting him. So please get to know the Institute if you don't know us already. Um, we're just down the road in Mountain View. And for you know a nominal fee of an exorbitant amount, we'll actually show you around if you want to come in and visit. So. Um, uh, in addition to tonight's talk, which is Antarctica as a Time Machine, our portal to snowball Earth and faraway worlds, I want to remind uh, uh, all of you that on February 13th, we will have our next SETI talk. That's going to be a fascinating discussion about the next NASA Space Telescope. So if you're interested in things like the James Webb Space Telescope or WFIRST and other planned instruments, come uh, to that talk. I think you'll find it very fascinating. And then on March 13th, a month later, we'll be talking about New Horizons and Ultima Thule. How many of you watched the Ultima Thule flyby on New Year's Eve? Excellent, excellent. Our own Mark Showalter was the lead of the hazard avoidance team for the New Horizons mission, both for Ultima Thule and the Pluto flyby. So it was great fun to watch Mark and Alan Stern and the team on that, that very special event, the farthest point of, of, of human exploration in the history of humankind. So very exciting. Two great talks upcoming. And with that, I'm going to turn the podium over to my colleague, Frank Marchese, who uh, presides over these talks to introduce tonight's speakers. Frank? Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> OK, good evening. Thank you for being here. So tonight, we're going to talk about Antarctica. And um, Antarctica is really the world of the continent of the extreme, southernmost, uh, no cities, uh, a lot of ice. We know that already, some weird animals. But there is also some very interesting species living there from time to time. We call them scientists. So those scientists, <laughs> they come to Antarctica because it's a great place for them to study the past of Earth, study how life adapts to extreme environment, and of course to uh, test some kind of uh, new space missions for icy world in our solar system. So to talk about this, today we invited three scientists who um, work, whose work is directly related to the study of Antarctica. The first one that I'm going to introduce is Peter Rupnarin, who is a paleontologist. He's a curator at the Institute of, for Biodiversity and Sustainability at the California Academy of Sciences. And uh, he's known for studying extreme life and extreme environment, especially the study of uh, cryosphere. The second uh, scientist here uh, we have tonight is Ariel Wallman. She's a citizen scientist and an artist. So Ariel is going to talk, talk to us about her experience as a citizen scientist in Antarctica. She's going to describe what she did over there, what kind of work she's been conducted, and how she's been involved in missions to study um, uh, future planetary bodies. And then we have, uh, of course, uh, Tyler McKee who is a geobiologist and postdoc at, the, at MIT. Um, Tyler is, has, uh, f is focused essentially his research on the study of uh, the cryosphere. He's going to tell us a little bit more about how Earth adapted to the cryosphere and how uh, l life survived this uh, interesting ep ep moment in, our, in the history of our own planet. And um, because we, it's not enough to have only two uh, SETI employees to talk at the SETI talk, we have a third one, and Seth Shostak here is going to be uh, taking care of the discussion. Thank you very much. Come on, guys. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, I'm only here to introduce the next six people. <laughs> but I know you want to get this show on the road, although that's not a good idea given the weather outside. So we're not going to do that. Uh, I am Seth Shostak, and I'm an astronomer at the Institute. Tonight, we're going to go to the bottom of the world, uh, unless you're from Australia, in which case we're going <laughs> to the top of the world, as the carpenters <laughs> would say. Would say. 
it's, it's hard to believe that it's been only a little over a century since Amundsen and Scott reached the South Pole. Today, you know, one lifetime later, a long lifetime later, scientists can live there in enough con uh, comfort to complain about the food. Now, I don't know if you find this interesting, but I think it's fair to say that when it comes to the heroic age of polar exploration, Scott, Amundsen, Shackleton, Peary, they became household names by doing something just at the moment in time when it was possible but not yet easy. Previous generations couldn't have done that. But, you know, 10 years, 15 years after Scott died on the ice down there, he could have gone back with radios, motorized transport that worked, and so forth. So there's always a window of opportunity for exploration. I think the people at the SETI Institute, our fellow scientists, know about that. But one thing I'd like to notice about Scott, he died on the ice. There was 35 pounds of rock on his sledge, 35 pounds. These rocks were research samples. His expedition eventually produced 15 volumes of uh, research notes and 40,000 specimens. Scott and his team did science. Not to take anything away from the Norwegians, but Amundsen did not do that. So tonight, we'll, <laughs> so well, maybe I will take something from the Norwegians. <laughs> uh, tonight, we'll hear from these three folks who've also ventured to Earth's nether regions for research and exploration. Frank has already introduced them. They are each going to get three minutes to summarize who they are, what they do, and why you should care. And we're going to be, uh, begin with Peter. Uh, you're first up, and I will try and... Uh, you yeah, want to run I'm, I'm, Yeah, I'm going to interrupt. <laughs> you don't want to hear from me. But uh, unfortunately, I just want to save somebody a real painful hassle later on. I've been told that somebody has a BMW, blue BMW, out in the parking lot with license 6RG E914 with your lights on. Um, we don't want, you know, bad things to happen when the talk is over. So I'm sorry for the interruption, but if it's your car, you might want to go and, and turn your lights off. So anyway, sorry. <laughs> That's good. Any questions about that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let, let's get right to it. Peter, uh, you're first up, and I'm going to try and show you. Can, can you see what Thank you, Seth. Yep. Um, so I'm Peter Rupnarain. I'm a, the curator of geology at the California Academy of Sciences, just up the road in Golden Gate Park. I'm a uh, paleontologist, biologist, and an oceanographer by training. And um, after many, many years of various types of research, most of my research an interest today, I would say, center on trying to understand ecosystem dynamics in Earth's past. So how the geosphere, the geology of the planet, um, affects and is affected by biological communities and, and their ecologies. In that sense, um, one of the things I'm most interested in, in, or in our attempts to understand this, one of the best avenues is looking at how ecosystems and communities behave under extremes. And of course, we have extremes present today, and we'll talk about that tonight. In the past, we've had a lot of intermittent extremes. So one of the figures uh, that's up there shows climate over the past 66 million years. And that climate over the past 66 million years has told us a lot about how uh, the planet evolves and how ecosystems evolve, and we've learned a lot. But over the last 50 years or so of geology, we've come to the realization that there have been many more incredible extremes that we haven't even been able to imagine in Earth's past. And so the other figure shows some of those swings in the past. One of the most notable and most recent sort of agreed upon realizations is Snowball Earth, the fact that the Earth has frozen over in the past almost entirely. This has happened several times. And that these episodes, along with episodes of like extreme heating, have, been major, have marked major transitions in the history of life. Uh, they're either partially driven by major transitions, like suddenly organisms making lots and lots of sub-oxygen, and or they've impacted or affected the way that life continu continues on. So we know, for example, that after the thawing of the last snowball Earth, very, very shortly afterward, we have one of the most amazing transitions in life, which is the appearance or evolution of macroscopic multicellular life forms, which fundamentally change the planet forever. And so my interest lies in really sort of understanding, using a lot of uh, basic fundamental geology, coupled with a lot of mathematical modeling and geochemistry and so on, to try to understand how these ecosystems were affected and behaved in the past. And these days, we're turning a lot of that uh, knowledge and understanding to trying to understand or forecast how current modern-day systems might um, 
weather the next uh, few hundred years to millennia as things are changing rapidly on the planet again. Terrific. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I, I, I guess snowball earth is not our immediate problem, is that right? Uh, uh, it, it unfortunately, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ariel Waldman. Yeah, so um, I'm Ariel Waldman. I uh, just got back from Antarctica uh, about a month ago. I was there for five weeks, um, and I was searching for life under the ice. So uh, these are some photos up here. Uh, I worked with divers to sample the seafloor and sample underneath the sea ice. That's me in uh, the observation tube uh, underneath the sea ice uh, shot by one of the divers, which is really cool. Um, I hiked up a glacier where I was able to drill into a glacier and actually get samples of microbes living embedded inside the ice. Um, and then the final photo uh, up there is um, me with an underwater robot that actually goes under the sea ice and uh, is able to explore the edges of glaciers and everything from the underside. Um, so I uh, really went to Antarctica for five weeks to explore all of this and to look and see what I could find, uh, which you can see on the next slide. Uh, and let's see if this plays. Maybe click it one more time. Oh, no. Uh, it's, oh, there we go. Yeah, so these are some of the microbes that I discovered underneath the ice. I, so I was actually acting as a microscopist um, in Antarctica. I was going to these locations, sampling things, and immediately putting them under the microscope to see what I could see. So uh, up here is a, a tardigrade, also known as a water bear. Um, an uh, ostracod, a uh, rotifer, and a ciliate. And at some point, the ciliate actually poops right there. Yep. <laughs> and uh, this is what I really love uh, because, you know, a lot of times when we think about Antarctica, we think it's barren and lifeless except for maybe some penguins. But the reality is, is that Antarctica has a ton of life, not only underneath the sea ice, but embedded in the glaciers and in subglacial ponds and all these different locations. Um, but we're not really familiar with what this life looks like and, and how it acts. And so I went there really to film this life um, and, and uh, in the coming months share more and more of it and uh, what it looks like so that we can all become familiar with all the life that actually lives there. Um, one of the frustrating bits is that a lot of scientists do go down to Antarctica and uh, sequence the life and can tell you what sort of life forms are down there. But maybe they only take one or two photos and then that goes into a scientific paper and barely anyone ever sees it. So I'm trying to actually get more um, media out there of what these microbes look like. We can go to the next slide. Um, so <laughs> this was uh, me at one of the uh, field camps in Antarctica. Um, I was based out of McMurdo Station, but I spent 10 days camping um, out at Lake Bonnie and Lake Hoare, which are field sites. Uh, where you just have a regular tent and it's five degree weather <laughs> and you just sleep out there and it's, uh, it's cold. Um, <laughs> this is me indoors with my microscope set up and uh, the thing that was really fascinating about all of my work was that this was funded, um, or this was supported rather, by a grant through the National Science Foundation Antarctic Artists and Writers Program. So actually, I'm not a scientist uh, formally. I went to art school, um, got my degree in graphic design, and uh, you know, over the last few years, I've had weird occurrences where I've stumbled into advising NASA, and I advise them on um, advanced technologies and concepts. And one of the things that's really important for the future of NASA is to be able to detect life on other planets or moons. And while NASA is very good at telling you if other planets or moons are habitable, they're not yet very good at telling you if they're staring straight at a fish, if there's actually a life form there. Um, and so I think by actually studying all these life forms in Antarctica, we can get a better sense of how we can detect life elsewhere in space and, and the solar system. And so uh, with all of this, this is sort of what motivated me, and I ended up teaching myself microscopy. I also joined the San Francisco Microscopy Society, which is a thing here. If you're interested in it, I totally recommend it. It's very <coughs> geeky, but a lot of fun. Um, and I actually uh, went to uh, Merritt College over in Oakland, uh, and got certified as an optical microscopist. Also, I could go to Antarctica and look at weird, creepy crawlies underneath ice. Okay. What, what, what's the credo of the uh, that association? Is it think small? <laughs> Pretty much, <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Tyler. Hi, I'm Tyler Mackey. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at MIT. And my research is really focused on exploring cold microbial habitats. So, um, this is an environment, much like Ariel just said, that 
looks barren on the surface, but is really teeming with microscopic life if you know where to look. And so on the, the next slide here, one of the places that is uh, beautiful to look is under the surface of those lakes. So here I am diving into Lake Frixel, which is one of these ice-covered lakes in the dry valleys of Antarctica. And I am getting ready to go down under 10 to 15 feet of ice to look at the microbial communities that are growing there. And in this setting, the microbial communities are really structured by this ice cover. We have an environment that, unlike the surface, where the temperatures are extreme, they range dramatically over the course of a year, we're insulated under this ice and have a remarkably stable environment, just marked by six months of daylight, six months of night. And so I'm going through, you can see the layers of bubbles that are marked by annual freezing on the underside of the ice cover. And once you go to the bottom, that remarkably stable environment allows these dramatic microbial communities to form macroscopic structures. These pretty much have the texture of wet noodles, but because there are no waves, no currents, no animals to dig them up, they can grow and cover this entire landscape. And using their shapes, we can understand how they grow and what they can tell us about the behavior of those microbial communities. And I think it's frozen before the end of the video, but uh, there are also areas, hey, look at that, <laughs> where we have the mats with dramatically different appearance and also textures. Here they're actually forming minerals inside of the mat. They're forming limestone in place. And the chemistry of those minerals can also tell us things about the way they live and the environment that they're growing in. So on the next slide here, if we don't want to loop through this again, I think we can cue the next. Great. Uh, we can go to the ancients. And here I am looking at uh, some a reef that was made by microbial communities just before uh, the first of those Snowball Earth episodes. And we can say something about the way that they're growing and the chemistry of those rocks that they're forming to look at what the life was doing and what sort of habitat they were growing in. And with these different data sets that we're curating in the modern and applying to the ancient, we can say something about what life was doing and how it was responding to these uh, major perturbations in Earth history as uh, Peter was describing previously. All right, Tyler Mackey, thank you very much. Here's uh, what we're gonna do now. We're going to, uh, I'm gonna throw a couple of questions at the crew here. They will discuss them in about 10 before the hour. So in like 30 minutes time, we will open up the discussion to you and you can grill these uh, folks like a waffle on the griddle by coming up to the microphone here in the foreground. Let, let me begin with you, Tyler, because uh, what's the most interesting stuff? You, well, no, let me ask you a different question. How do these living things down there at the bottom of these lakes, first off, where are the lakes, right? And second, because they're not near the South Pole, I presume, uh, but how do they make a living? I mean, you know, there's not a whole lot of photo photosynthesis. Well, so these lakes are found in coastal areas primarily where you have uh, polar desert oases. And these are areas where the glaciers are blocked by mountains and keep the bulk of the ice out. And you have local glacier melt that feeds these lakes. And depending on the local conditions, the ice cover can range from five feet to 40 feet thick, sometimes freezing the entire water body. So the ice cover itself actually does let enough light through that photosynthesis really anchors this ecosystem. These uh, microbial mats can get by based on just 0.1% of the ambient light that's hitting the top of the ice cover. And uh, they are very shade adapted and um, are uh, certainly making it through half a year with no light at that. So Indoor they, plants. They are exactly, yes. Okay, are there any animals living down there? Uh, there are a few uh, sub-millimeter crustaceans, uh, copepods that are present in these lakes, mm -hmm. um, in one of the lakes in particular, but uh, by and large, nematodes, other microscopic organisms, are really uh, the, the lions of this ecosystem. One, 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 more, one more question for you. You know, 35 million years ago, uh, Antarctica was a kinder, gentler place, mm. and uh, you know, presumably there was quite a bit of biota down there. Is any of that still there? Well, that's, that's interesting, and I think it gets into a lot of questions about how microbes propagate across the planet. Are the microbes that are currently in these polar environments uh, related to the organisms from the North Polar regions or are from alpine areas? 
this is an area of really active research. Uh, the, the trajectory of these ecosystems is is very sensitive to the starting conditions. And most of the lakes that I'm looking at there dried out almost completely about 1,000 years ago. So they've been seeded since then with new communities and uh, are reflecting the local history. But uh, it's, it's definitely a, a story of exclusion by the changes of the climate over the last millions of years. But if there are any natives, they would be microscopic, exactly. not, not the things we saw there. <laughs> exactly. I see. Okay, uh, Ariel, you had the very rare privilege of securing an invite to go to Antarctica. I think there are a lot of people in the audience. How many of you would want to go to Antarctica? How many of you been to Antarctica? There's Somewhat couple, fewer, a few. but a few. It's not zero. Okay. Uh, <laughs> in any case, but you're a, you know you weren't going as part of a research team, but you're a very media savvy person, perceptive citizen. Uh, were you exclusively at the South Pole? Uh, so I was based out of McMurdo, um, and uh, while I wasn't part of a research team, I was my own research team. So I was a, a PI um, on my own exploratory grant, which was a really amazing experience uh, to be able to do that. But, um, but yeah, I was at McMurdo uh, for five weeks, but then I spent 10 days in the dry valleys camping there. Okay, so you were around the edges, as it were. Yeah. Uh, and, and Presumably, you sent back tweets. I mean, did they have the capability, the technical capability for you to communicate kind of? Because I know you like to do that. Yeah. Right? I mean, you, you learned that from the political system. Do you, do you, do you like to <laughs> do real-time uh, observations down there? Yeah, I mean, I was able to get some stuff out. So the internet down there obviously is not very good. There's not many polar orbiting satellites. And because of that, the bandwidth is very constrained. But going to Antarctica, at least going to the uh, US uh, McMurdo station, is kind of like going back to the 90s. Uh, everyone has pagers, everyone uses pagers, uh, and because uh, no one is allowed to use their mobile phones, you're not allowed to put your mobile phone onto the internet. Um, you plug in using an ethernet connection, uh, there's very rarely Wi-Fi, and uh, yeah, you use GPS to like locate yourself as you go around, like an actual like physical GPS device, not on your phone. Um, and so, yeah, it was a bit like going back to the 90s. Y you can get like a tweet or two out, but most websites are pretty, pretty slow to load. Did you go any farther back than the 90s? Did you see Scott's Hut there <laughs> in McMurdo Town? I did not. <laughs> did not see Scott's Hut. Hey, you know, uh, this is a, kind of a dumb question, but that's the kind I ask. Uh, these other two fellows spent a lot of time at the bottom of the planet and you less so. So consequently, I value your opinion a little bit more to tell me What's it really like down there? Because is it, as you would guess from the movies, you know, it's just some sort of, I don't know, gelid, frigid hell? Is it awful? What is it like? Uh, so I was there at the beginning of summer, so I kind of got to see some of the transition from the less nice weather to the nicer weather. And it's all, dedicated, it's all dictated by wind. Like, if, if it's freezing cold, but there's no wind, it's like an awesome day. Uh, but, like, just... A barely a hint of wind, and you're like, oh, this is miserable. I'm out. <laughs> but um, most of the buildings and everything are, are, are very well insulated, so you're actually, like, you're not that cold. It, 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 if you're based out of McMurdo Station, like, in the buildings, it's very warm, um, and you sort of, like, dart between buildings and, you know, spend five minutes between buildings. But if you're out camping in the dry valleys, um, you know, so I, I did 10 days. Some people do much longer stretches out there. There's no showers. Uh, you have to separate your liquids and solids when it comes to human waste. Uh, it, it's very cold. Uh, the way you um, keep warm at night when you're in this just a regular camping tent like you would see anywhere else, you've got a sleeping bag and you've got a fleece li liner to that sleeping bag and then you put your parka over your sleeping bag and then I would put uh, boiling water into two hot water bottles and put one at my feet and one at my chest and then I would have my hand warmers, and then I would have my neck gaiter, and then I would have my hat, and then I would bury myself under all that, and I was like barely warm enough. <laughs> okay. So uh, if you're out camping, yeah, you, you feel the cold. Uh, uh, okay. So you could actually, could you picture you know, guys like Shackleton, you know, man hauling uh, across the raw side shelf there to the tunes of Ralph on Williams or whatever? I mean, yeah, could, I, could you kind of picture that? I would not do that. <laughs> I think such as, are you going to write the book, My Trip to Terra Incognita? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'll follow up on that later. All right. Peter, um, 
Snowball Earth, we've heard about it a couple of times here, and there may be some people who don't know what Snowball Earth was or is. Some of them may have lived through it. Tell us what it was. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Snowball Earth, um, the, the science story, the person story behind it, is actually very interesting. Our first Snowball Earth refers to any time in the past when, or I guess in the, in the future, when the Earth has, is frozen almost completely over. So it's covered with ice from pole to pole, um, we know now that it's probably never been completely covered. There are small areas of open ocean that actually turn out to be very important. But the whole idea of Snowball Earth started maybe 80 years ago or more when geologists first noticed uh, telltale signs of glacial activity. So lots of uh, what are called drop stones or drop boulders, which are uh, large chunks of geological material that are transported to areas and dropped and that can only happen by being uh, trapped and carried in glaciers and then drop glaciers retreat. But these things were occurring in areas, uh, tropical areas, for example, that one, um, were never known to have glaciated, and two, were very puzzling because they're in the tropics. And this, uh, these observations were first made before the concept or theory of plate tectonics. So it wasn't widely accepted then that continents move about, but as uh, plate tectonics came on board, and we understand that the continents do move around all the time, and, and the configuration of the planet is very um, dynamic over Earth's history. Then we fast forward to the 1960s, and there are two really neat little observations. One of them is just a, a, a Russian who was developing one of the first sort of heat energy balance models for the planet, and one of the bizarre outcomes that he has uh, that he found was if you run the model in one direction enough, it predicts that the planet can be completely frozen over. And everybody said, gee, wow, is, isn't that really uh, kind of interesting? And then the other um, observation was really firming up the, uh, the discovery of these unusual anomalous geological deposits that were very, very old. They don't correspond to any of the glaciations we know, certainly not the last uh, two and a half million years, for example, but they're very old, and the estimates was that they could be a billion years old, old or more. And then finally in the 1980s, the idea was put together that uh, the only explanation can be that uh, this model is correct, and under some circumstances, a planet can become frozen over. And so we know now that sometime between, say, 800 to 600 million years ago or so, there were at least maybe three times when glaciers would advance from the poles, the planet would become almost completely frozen. Uh, that ice would retreat and then re-expand very quickly. And sometime a little more than 600 million years ago, uh, the, the planet thawed out. And we've had episodes ever since where we fluctuate between what we call like a, um, a hothouse planet, where the planet's pretty warm, there's no ice at the poles, to an ice house planet where we have uh, ice at the poles that started, you know, as you mentioned earlier, 35 million years ago. Okay, so if we could go, we, you get one of those time machines that they've shown in the <coughs> films and, and go back 600 million years, uh, point one, is it guaranteed that there really was a snowball earth? I mean, is that, that a slam dunk? Do we know that for sure now? Well, I would say yes. <laughs> okay, I mean, uh, you, you, your point of view is clear. But what would it have looked like? I mean, what, yeah. were, were the oceans frozen? The oceans that are kind of salty. Oceans were know. almost completely frozen. The continents were completely covered in ice. There were bands around the tropics of open ocean, and these turn out to be very important. And uh, complete freezing is probably not possible because the Earth generates its own internal heat, of course, and so the oceans are not frozen solid to the bottom. There are open areas where we have uh, geothermal, hydrothermal activity. And we also have what's really very important for coming out of Snowball Earth, we have active volcanism. And what that volcanism is doing is not only it's, it's melting ice in local areas, but massive episodes of volcanism over long periods of time are building up carbon dioxide, that greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. And because biological activity is very low, because the planet's covered with, with ice, Right, then that uh, carbon dioxide can accumulate in the atmosphere and we'll tilt that little mathematical model eventually. It's, it's a tipping point. We'll send that tipping point in the other direction. You have these areas of open ocean 
uh, that have low albedo, so they're absorbing a lot, of, uh, a lot of the sun's energy. You melt a bit of, of the ice, they absorb more of that energy, and you get a runaway process going the other way. We don't know what triggered, really, or we're not in broad agreement on to what might have triggered the snowball Earth in the first place, but we know that from what we understand of the Earth's, uh, of the Earth system, it's definitely possible, and there's a tremendous amount of evidence to support so, it. So, so you had two kind of things happening. You have positive feedback. There are a lot of double E types in the audience, I yeah. suspect, yep. right? You had positive feedback at first. When we cover it with enough snow, then it reflects more sunlight. It just gets colder. You get more snow. I mean, it sounds to me like that could be a runaway problem, yeah. but okay. But then you get a little bit of heating because some volcano, uh, volcanic system goes off, and now you get uh, positive feedback the other yeah, way. Yeah. Is, is that it's, it? It's a, classic, it's a classic tipping point system, yeah. Okay, yeah. and, uh, and, and this is really for Tyler because you said that the most recent one, I mean, you said there might have been three of these, right? Three episodes. The most recent one was 600 million years ago, and I'm old enough to know that that was an interesting time. The papers were full of stories about, <laughs> I mean, you know, 600 million years ago, there wasn't anything on the, on the land. You didn't kill a lot of plants or anything like that. But that's when, you know, the uh, Cambrian explosion which ruined life in southern England for all those living there. The Cambrian <laughs> explosion happened. Um, is that coincidence, that those two numbers being the same? Well, I feel like that's a good question for, for Peter, but I think that uh, one of the questions is if these glacial periods were bottlenecks or if they were actually stimulating evolution. So the habitats that were present during these glaciations, those little areas where enough light could come through or there was local warming, Maybe it was the first time that we had cold water habitats that could be potential uh, oases for life. But there, there, might be, there might be a relationship there, and we need to sort out what the causality is. If it's something that uh, the survivors just barely made it through, and then they were the ones who could go ahead and uh, expand and become more complex in these ecosystems, or could this actually have stimulated their emergence? I guess, I guess the question really is, was it essential to have a snowball Earth in order to have anything in the audience bigger than a microbe? That is, I think, a fundamental question because the ecological expansion of algae, which might not sound like much to us, but in terms of the history of life is a dramatic event going from bacteria doing all the primary production to having eukaryotes doing the primary product, uh, productivity. Uh, that is associated tenuously with these snowball earth episodes. And it might be that there was some sort of tipping point biologically associated with these tipping points in the climate. Well, wasn't, wasn't one of the things like the great oxygenation event like is connected to mm -hmm. snowball earth. So, yeah. so potentially the thing that yeah is giving us life is actually the thing that could have set off one of the snowball earth periods. The, well, the great oxygenation event for people who you know gave away their textbooks at the end of high school. Uh, that was, but I thought that was roughly two billion years ago, right? When suddenly the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere you know, got close to what it is now, what, 21% or whatever. Uh, but was there, was there a, a, Peter, was there a snowball Earth event two billion years ago? I mean, so could, there, could there are right? suggestions and there is evidence that maybe the first snowball Earth event was associated with the great oxygenation, something we call the Huronian Snowball Earth, but the evidence is more tenuous there. But the great oxygenation event would certainly have set the stage for the later um, Snowball Earth events because this is it's part of the process of this. Again, the, it's a biological feedback or ecological feedback that's taking place now where you have these larger, more uh, complex primary producers. The energy base of the ecosystems has, has really ramped up and everything is moving a bit faster. It's still a microbial world. But uh, microbes are more sophisticated, the microbes are more energetic, and uh, levels of oxygen in the earth are slowly using up. Uh, we have things like no more free iron on, on the surface of, of the planet, for example. If any of you ever seen iron stones? Iron stones disappear when oxygen comes along and, and poisons the planet. Um, so the planet is changing, but it, it is puzzling why we do have this this long gap, in, well, that gap is just puzzling for many reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, we do have free iron on the surface. Just look at 101, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, what, Peter, you know, Ariel has described how she uh, accustomed herself, acclimatized herself, I don't know if that would be the right verb here, to th these kind of 
frigid conditions down there. Could she look forward to another snowball earth? Is this going to happen? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you never, you never say never when it comes to planet Earth, but it's, it's, it's I, think, I think, far less likely now than it would have been in the past because of biology, because of the biosphere that we have now, where it's not as straightforward to push the planet from one extreme to, to another. For example, the stimulating the Cambrian explosion is probably no longer ever, ever possible anymore unless we really, truly eliminate most of the complex life on the planet because life buffers a lot of these physical and chemical processes so, today. So sort of a Gaia hypothesis. Yeah. We've, we change the planet enough that snowball Earth will probably not be in our future. Yeah. That's, that's your but guess. But I, I wouldn't rule it out entirely. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask what your gut tells you. but Okay. <laughs> let, let, let me switch topics a little bit. Um, did you see any meteorites down there, Ariel? Uh, I did not. I, I heard about the folks who go meteorite hunting because it was something that uh, I had sort of been interested in over the last few years. But I heard it's pretty like they're really like out there for like several weeks at a time and like snowmobiling around, creating like camps along the way to find meteorites. It sounded like a, you have to be pretty hardcore to actually go meteorite hunting in well, Antarctica. Uh, I, you know, the biggest science news story of 1996 was ALH 84001. Now, it is a little rock about the size of a baked potato, but less tasty. Uh, that was picked up in Antarctica at the Allen Hills. Where, you guys must know where the Allen Hills are. Yeah, it's uh, right away from McMurdo. It's uh, one of the prime spots to go drive grids with a snowmobile and look for little okay, black rocks. So it's that close. Well, you, I think it's, do you have to do a fixed wing transport there? It wasn't close enough to like go for a right, day trip, right. I don't think. You definitely, it's supported through McMurdo Station, yeah. but it's, okay. it's uh, not, uh, we, we, not a day trip. Uh, uh, you know, those of you who are texting this, which you should be doing, uh, <laughs> Steve Boudreau, our, our development director, has promised that the sixth person to text in uh, may get a steam-powered bowling ball or a trip to the Allen Hills. Now, <laughs> the, the, some, some question that I uh, had when this story came out was, I believe something like 80 or 90 percent of all the meteorites being found these days are picked up in Antarctica. So my first thought was, okay, so this meteor is coming in toward Earth, and it gets close to our planet and has to make a decision, <laughs> right? Am I going to you know, Passaic, New Jersey, right? Belgium? <laughs> no, I'll go to Antarctica, right? Well, certainly 80 to 90% of them don't. So what's the reason that so many of them are found down there? Is it because people are bored and they go look? I mean, that's certainly part of it. Uh, you know, I mean, finding meteorites in Antarctica is, is fairly easier because it's all white. It, you have ice. And so actually being able to find dark patches on the ice is actually a lot easier than finding them in the middle of a rainforest or where the majority of meteorites end up, which is in the ocean and on the sea floor. Um, I think there was actually a um, deep sea expedition on the Nautilus uh, deep sea vessel this, this year to search for a meteorite. And I don't think they were entirely successful because you're searching the entire ocean floor for a tiny thing and you don't have that color contrast that you do in Antarctica. So finding a lot of meteorites in Antarctica uh, is fairly easy, uh, both because, yeah, I guess people decide that they want to actually go out and, and do this for several weeks at a time, but also because of the color contrast and being able to find them much more easier. Yeah, well, I guess if a rock's on top of the ice, it's probably from the sky as opposed to the, the rocks in Antarctica, which yeah, are under the ice, right? most likely. Like, a lot of, you know, Antarctica is a, a large continent, for, the, for those that haven't seen it on, like, a, a more accurate map. It's uh, roughly the size of North America. It's, like, just a little bit smaller than all of North America. So it's it's large, but it's really, for most of it, it's just snow and ice. You know, there's nothing around. Uh, so, yeah, fi finding anything that is just not white is a pretty easy job for humans. What, what, what about the effect of glaciers sort of, you know, uh, collecting these things for you? Well, I think that's a big part of what makes the Allen Hill so special is that it's where a lot of the ice is lost on the surface. So there's flow within the, the polar ice cap. And ice that is sourced from different parts of the continent will flow into areas where you have a lot of loss by ablation, where you have uh, winds coming through and removing a lot of material. 
So you're, you're effectively concentrating the material that lands on top of the, the ice, and I'm guessing it was also probably chosen because it avoids the areas where you get a lot of plucked glacial material from uh, the subsurface that could confuse and confound you with color contrast. Yeah. Okay, well we have only about a few minutes before we're gonna open this up to questions. So I, I would like each of you to uh, briefly comment on the import of studies in Antarctica, because that was the advertising for this, uh, for this session here. The import this has on the search for life elsewhere. And uh, uh, Peter, why don't we start with you? I mean, you, you know, huh? how, how does this bear? When people say, well, what's the point, right? Yeah. And uh, obviously the point, I mean, there are many points, but in terms of looking for life beyond Earth. Well, I think one of the questions that we've had about snowball Earth at least initially, is how could life have possibly have survived uh, having a fr an, in a frozen planet for a couple of hundred million of years? And obviously the best way we have of understanding that, I think of studies in, in Antarctica, but those very same studies, of course, are what informing us uh, how can life actually subsist in a uh, completely frozen or nearly uh, frozen environment and just our Basic observations of Antarctica tell us it's entirely possible. We need to understand a few things, like the origin and how you sustain or generate heat, but it's an entirely possible. So it's, it's our proof that it's, it's uh, feasible. Yeah, Ariel, you want to weigh in? Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, I think, uh, like I, I said at the, the top of everything, you know, I think by actually studying microbes in extreme environments, we can better understand how to find them in other extreme environments that we find in the solar system or on exoplanets. There are a lot of different ways in which people are generating databases and curating ways of, of eventually finding life. One uh, has been, uh, I remember some biologists, created a, a Pantone set of essentially colors of microbes on the surface of the Earth everywhere so that one day when we get images of exoplanets, planets around other stars, yeah. we can sort of compare the colors that we see and see if they match up to any microbes that we see on the surface of the Earth. Other ways are, I think, uh, using microscopy like I am uh, and, and using digital holographic microscopy, which is uh, just another form of microscopy, but to actually embed microscopes when we go explore other planets or other moons and being able to detect life that way. Um, I think in my personal experience, it's incredibly exciting not only to better understand how these life forms move and, and interact and, and how they can be embedded in places that we otherwise wouldn't associate with life, um, but even for finding life on Earth in places that we don't yet know life can exist. Uh, so one example is when I was out in the field, there is a um, pond called the Don Juan Pond in Antarctica. It's the saltiest body of uh, water on Earth. Um, we have not yet confirmed really conclusively if there is life in this pond. Uh, people have maybe thought there could be, but it's not really certain. And so I was able to take a sample from this pond, put it under the microscope, and immediately show some scientists there that there was actually moving things that looked like moving bacteria in there. And that was incredibly exciting because while it's not conclusive about life being there or if it got inserted there or, or whatever, it really inspired scientists to keep looking and keep looking at these different places. So I think by just uh, understanding life more and, and looking at it more, actually looking at it with our eyes or our microscopes more, uh, we can better understand how to find life elsewhere in the universe. And that really excites me personally. Tyler, uh, you know, do you ever tell people, show them that video of you, you know, swimming down there and say, that's what the aliens will look like, right? <laughs> Maybe a lot of them do look like that. Yeah, well, I think that microbial life is a really good place to start looking for what uh, key characteristics might be uh, relevant for the search for life. And I think it's less charismatic than things that are currently swimming around, but dead life can also be very informative. And looking at areas in Antarctica where we have the accumulated sediments of these lakes, of areas where we know that there's microbial communities growing, can really help us when we go to places like Mars and look in the Paleolake deposits of these craters, where we may have had ice covers in similar environments to what's currently in Antarctica with these ephemeral water bodies. If we can come up with characteristics of these patterns of growth, of the way that they interact with their environment, we might be able to say if this was produced by life or if this was produced by minerals just forming in that environment without life. And 
identify where the false positives might be in the search for life from uh, historical extraterrestrial communities. So dead things do tell tales. Yes, they yeah. do. <laughs> All right, well, I invite the audience to come on down. You just line up in front of that microphone. And uh, I, I would only ask, be sure you, you actually pose a question and don't <laughs> deliver your own speech. If you wish to do that, send an email to us and we'll consider it. Um, and the, the, the second thing is you can, in fact, address somebody uh, in, you know, in particular, if you say, you know, Peter, would you, whatever. Okay, thank you. Uh, so as a diver in Monterey, you could probably guess this is probably going to be for you. Uh, logistically, um, so it looked like you had uh, three lines going down and you were surface fed, so that was air, radio, yeah. and... So we had air uh, voice communications, and the last line is called the pneumo. It's a line that can be pressurized by the surface to tell what depth you're at. Mm. They can measure the pressure that that line picks up. You can also use it to inflate lift bags or do other tasks that require just a little bit more air underwater. And was that a bailout um, bottle or it was, was that exactly. argon for your uh, with dry suit? Uh, so that was uh, a secondary air supply on the back and it feeds into the, the full face mask. Um, I only once almost had to use it when I was diving and came to the point that I realized I'd breathed all my air out of the umbilical that had been pressurized instead of out of the tanks that were on a bank, and that valve was stuck. Yeah. So my mask just started suctioning against my face a little bit. I was like, excuse me, uh, <laughs> I'm running out of air down here. If you could just make sure that valve is wiggled and stuck. open, um, but never have actually had to crack that. that so thing. I think I'd love to dive in Antarctica. Do I really want to? Sometimes it's better to be the diver than the support crew on the surface. The water, the coldest it's going to get is freezing. When you're up on the surface and it's windy and cloudy and cold, especially windy, uh, you don't always want to be there. Um, in Lake Vanda, where that uh, video of the blue pinnacles uh, came from, uh, the water there is four degrees centigrade. So compared to some of these other lakes, it's like a tropical vacation. <laughs> Yeah. Cool. Thanks very much. I, I am not Thank a diver, much. but uh, I have to say, so going to Antarctica and, and hearing about divers, I was just like, why would you do that? That sounds miserable and like so cold. I didn't get it. But then I went down into that observation tube in that photo earlier, and I got to see under the ice, and it's just gorgeous. It's ab There's so much life. Uh, around the sea ice, around Antarctica, around the continent, and it was so beautiful. I, it, I was just like, I get it now. I get why you would go through that to yeah. like see everything. It's well, really it's beautiful. It's only 12 degrees Celsius colder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So how bad can that be? Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, if we can, I don't know if it's possible in the back there to, you know, boost the uh, level of the microphone here. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, you, you, if, if, you, you can raise it or lower it. Uh, most people seem to think other body parts make noise. Uh, in this case, I, I must say I've been in a couple of dives myself. But sorry, <laughs> it's my turn, Seth. <laughs> uh, this question is actually—it's about art and communicating to the public, but it's for all three of you because I want to get the scientists' opinion as well. Um, how how do you see the role of communicating? With, I mean, we, we saw, we had a show of hands of people who wanted to go to Antarctica who never have, and probably most of us never will, but even the general public who might not be especially interested, but especially with the climate change and all of this and how it affects Antarctica uh, sort of first, uh, how, how do you see the role of communication, all three of you, how do you see the role of communication with the public um, and how important that is, especially when you've got scientists doing some really cool no pun intended, research, and uh, you want to communicate that in a way that's outside of the field to the general public. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll take that first. Uh, so for me, you know, I'm still processing a lot since I've only been back for a month, but a lot of what's important to me is really showing that um, Antarctica is, you know, it's part of Earth. And I think it's very easy to say, Antarctica is this place that very few people have been to. It's not very hospitable to life. It, we almost treat it like it's a different planet. And when I come back, everyone's like, was it like an alien planet? Was it totally weird? And it's like, sort of, but I'm still on Earth. I'm still with gravity. I'm still with the atmosphere. And, and it, 
is reminiscent of other places you've been on Earth, you know, other mountainscapes and other places. And so I think one of the things that's really important about communication when it comes to Antarctica is, is yes, you can do all this like out there research of like space exploration, but it's also bringing home that this is part of our home and there are interesting parts of that home that are very connected to everyday life here. So some of the microbes that I was showing, you can find tardigrades everywhere on earth. You can find them in your backyard. You can find them in sidewalks, you know? And so I think for me, some of the thing is, is actually about actually better normalizing Antarctica and making it less foreign and less exotic um, so that we better understand that we're kind of a cohesive ecosystem. Um, I, I think that part is important. And certainly I think getting this communication out there not only affects you know, how people generally think about things, but it can also affect the future of, of science because um, I'm trying to get the word out that there's a ton of microbial life in Antarctica. Well, that's only a recent discovery generally for a lot of the places that I went to. There, there's places like Lake Bonnie where people thought it was completely dead for a while and then we slowly discovered that there's bacteria in there. And, um, that affected the course of science and, and how we thought about things. So for me, it, it's both about affecting people inside of science and outside, um, but kind of making it less exotic, I guess. Peter, did you want to weigh in? Oh, okay, sure. Um, well, one of the things that I spend a lot of time working on is uh, sort of global biological change, and both in the past and in, it's a pretty interesting time to be alive and be a scientist right now because we're running a massive experiment on the planet. And um, we do a lot of work understanding how perturbations of uh, various ecosystems affect the uh, future of those ecosystems. And we understand how to do this, at least in my research area and group, by looking at how ecosystems have behaved in the past and weathered it and so on. And some of the work that we've done in, has involved Arctic uh, marine ecosystems, we're beginning to look at Antarctic marine ecosystems that are spectacular, but one of the reasons why we're so very interested in them is that uh, the, these are ecosystems that have been isolated for several tens of millions of years as Antarctica has become ice-bound. They've developed their own unique ecologies, and they're very instructive, and they're changing very rapidly because the barriers of isolation are breaking down quite rapidly as the oceans around Antarctica warm. And one of the things that we're beginning to see are larger, more complicated, more sophisticated, if you will, uh, types of ecologies move in to Antarctica. And what we do know from our work, and Tyler touched on this earlier, any biological community or ecological community is what you have is a product that's very sensitive to the starting conditions, the initial conditions. These are sort of path-dependent histories, and there's no easy or reversibility going back and forth. And once you alter those uh, histories and trajectories, future trajectories, once you change them, you've set it on, on a new path. And that's ex essentially what's happening today. And these are systems that we're just barely beginning to understand. In the Arctic, it's completely fully underway. The Arctic is being flooded right now by organisms from the North Pacific. And within, within my lifetime, I remember the 90s and the technology very well. Uh, you know, within my lifetime, I'll see the, the North Atlantic begin to respond to those changes from the North Pacific. We're going to see the same thing in, in Antarctica. And a lot of the uh, communication that I do to the public really centers on trying to understand, our, our almost desperate need to understand and appreciate the systems that we have today because they are changing very rapidly, and there are things to be appreciated for their uh, sheer intrinsic value, but also we're, we're heavily dependent on these systems. Just, just a question for the audience. How many of you ever read uh, Apsley Cherry Gerard's The Worst Journey in the World? Two. Okay. All right, I commend that book to you. Yeah. It'll, it'll make you want to go to Antarctica, <laughs> despite the hardships. We have quite a long line here. Thank so I'm you. <laughs> get, uh, so let's, let's see Mine's if we can get to Mine's a quick question. I was wondering whether the sun, I understand it's warming up, and so it's brighter today. I don't know if it's warmer, but it's brighter now than it was in the past. Could that explain why there are fewer or no uh, snowball Earths? 
So I think them? that's actually the, I usually think about in the reverse, why wasn't early Earth always frozen? That's one of the great paradoxes that Carl Sagan tried to explore with atmospheric chemistry. Um, and I think that is uh, a definite trajectory of Earth's history where we do need to think about the interaction between our solar system home and our own planetary evolution in that context. And then layering on top of that how biology is changing our atmosphere in response to the, uh, the warming of the sun. Yeah, it's definitely a, a parameter there. Uh, if you want a number there, uh, the sun gets brighter by about 10 to the minus 11th percent every day. So you can work out how long it's going to be before you have to replace your Ray-Bans. you got about a billion years. <laughs> If there was one piece of advice you would give to someone going to Antarctica, what would it be? Oh, <laughs> Do you want to take that first, Tyler? Sure. <sighs> you might have forgot to pack. <laughs> <laughs> I think packing good people is the thing that I would suggest. Go with people that you really like exploring with and that you want to share those experiences with because I think the the experience is such an alien experience, even if it is systems that are present all around the world, we're isolating ourselves from our family, from our friends, from easy communication, that going with people that you can share this, uh, this experience with, I think is the most important part. I, I would say that's a really good answer. Uh, for me, the thing that caught me off guard when I went to Antarctica was everyone talks about how cold it is, so you pack all of the gear for being like really cold. But Antarctica is a desert, and no one really tells you that much about it. Everyone's like, oh, it's so cold, but it's really dry. It's drier than any desert I've ever been to. And so you feel it like in your face and in your hands and just everywhere. It's so dry, and the, and the dryness actually is more irritating day to day than the cold is. So, uh, you know, uh, some people do neti pots, humidifiers lotion on your hands all the time like that was something that like I wasn't entirely prepared for just how dry it was I think that's a lot worse on base than it is in the field because on yeah. base you're expected to shower <laughs> and that dries you out like yeah. nothing else so when you're in the field you develop your own little oily patina that keeps you a little bit more <laughs> moisturized <gross. laughs> I would agree with Tyler all of my experience over the years working in various environments the one common thing that I've learned is that I have to be very, very particular about the people that I go with. And I think it, maybe, you know, they'll tell you that that's maybe me. <laughs> uh, but I have to be very particular. I want people that I know that I can rely on and that I can trust to share, share the experience with. So over the years, I've developed my own sort of like folks that wherever I'm going, whatever I'm doing, those are some of my go-to people. Yeah, you can start making your list now of your friends that you want to take. Uh, just a quick number, Peter, from you. Uh, I, I think you, you would know this number because you talked a little bit about the, you know, the insight we can get into climate change and things like that from this sort of thing. What, what fraction of the Earth's fresh water is locked up in Antarctica? <laughs> okay, anybody yeah. with the right answer here? But, yeah. Anybody know? I... I was told, and I've forgotten now. Yeah, okay. I don't know. I, I know the, the majority of it is in the, the Greenland ice sheet, but there must be a substantial amount in really? Antarctica also. Oh, really? yeah. Okay, we have two more people who want to ask questions. That'll be great. Oh, I was just wondering if you do any sequencing of the genomes for the microorganisms that you find in Antarctica. And the reason why I ask is for its relevance for uh, optogenetics, which is a branch of neurocognition. Mm. I'm not sure about relevance to that particular field, but one of my uh, field mates who went to Antarctica with me is in the audience right now, Megan. She does specifically focus on that branch of... Uh, I could just chat with... Yes, them. certainly. Um, but I think that that's an area where collaborating with people who are asking those questions can be fantastic. I don't personally do it, but I'm happy to give them microbial biomass and have them... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, about how long does, about how long did the, the most recent snowball Earth last? Good question. Yeah. Well, 
if we're correct, and that there are about three episodes. They, they varied in length from maybe the shortest one would have been under 70 million years. The longest one might have been closer to 100 million years. So it's a very, very long period of time. But of course, in the history of, of the Earth, uh, you know, uh, 4 billion years, there are fairly short episodes. Long enough to make it interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, very, very long. And also, uh, does global warming go... Is global warming uh, one of the reasons why Snowball Earth ended? Yeah, I think that's uh, the feedback of CO2 coming into the atmosphere from those volcanoes, as Peter was mentioning, yeah. is the same principle as our, our current experience, but much more extreme. So there you're building up CO2 instead of by us burning uh, fuel, it's based on volcanoes emitting CO2 from, from the Earth itself. And there's no way to get it out of the system when the planet is frozen over as rapidly. So it can build up and build up and build up and give you the same greenhouse effect. Got it. Thank you. Thank Great you. Great question. Great. And it's kind of like maybe a last question. Uh, could you just like give some kind of like insight about international cooperation on this uh, uh, continent because like we have like many flags but pretty much it's uh, under no flags yeah. okay. um, well I think I'll, I'll start with that I guess I've um, gone down through the US and the New Zealand program for uh, for Antarctic work and in those groups have had people from a number of different countries underneath of that that organizational structure and it is a very collaborative environment where you have uh, I think much like like space can be. You have people who rely on each other for expertise, who rely on each other for uh, the pipeline of resources going down there. The US Antarctic program base is the hub for many different countries' operations in that area. And I think that by pooling resources, we can do a lot more science than we can as individual nations down there. And the scientists themselves just want to get their, their work done and. Uh, collaborate with the best people. And so we do that irrespective of the nationality that they come from there. I see. I'm just uh, kind of like thought about uh, the, and, like the follow-up question. Are you well-funded? Do you have like <laughs> any, <laughs> any, any uh, <laughs> Never. <laughs> oh, I think it's, it's very competitive to get funding to go to Antarctica at the start. It's, Le usually less than 10% success rate for a proposal that you send in to get supported. Uh, once you are supported, you have crafted your budget, and they only accept uh, projects that they know they'll be able to uh, support with the current budgets of the different agencies, be it NASA or the National Science Foundation. So once you are accepted and you've gotten your budget approved, you're very well funded for what you asked for. If you need more than that, then there are a lot of negotiations that have to take place. But uh, generally, if they think your science is worth doing with their budget priorities and their, uh, their directives, they will do their best to make it happen. But you have to get to that point first. Yeah, I have a slightly different experience since I went on the NSF Antarctic Artists and Writers Grant. So it took me five years to get the grant uh, of just continuous work. And then I finally got it but uh, it absolutely uh, funds nothing. They pay for your flight, they pay for your food and your stay in Antarctica, but all of my equipment, all of my time, uh, even my hotel in New Zealand, which I was required to stay at, not funded at all. So I had to actually create a Patreon campaign and uh, fund it all myself, and I've never been snowboarding or, or skiing in my life, so I had no cold weather gear, had to buy all of that, and yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I really wanted to go, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but it was expensive, uh, extremely and, and difficult. Uh, so I think one of the reasons that program is able to stay on for so many years is because they don't really have much money behind it. So, uh, so you can go, but yeah, so no funding. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, because these talks are so well funded, <laughs> we have, uh, in, in, in lieu of the honoraria that they would normally claim, we're giving them these mugs. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>